but I can't tell if we're live yet, so I'm going to pretend we're live and people get me cut off, that's okay because you're the important people up there. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Shane. I'm the town manager. Uh, we tonight are hoping to have a uh, kind of an interactive meeting with our, um, our residents. Uh, we had uh, um, an accident, uh, oh gosh, it must have been six to eight weeks ago in one of the crosswalks along uh, Main Street up near Farwell Ave that uh, really initiated a lot of uh, concerns from uh, parents, pedestrians, bicyclists, and um, we have worked hard to get uh, a panel together here tonight to um, walk us through potentially some of the ideas and uh, things that uh, they have seen in their professional practices as well as uh, our law, law enforcement people here. Uh, Chief Rumsey is here um, and Amy Owens, uh, our uh, school resource officer and what they're seeing and what they can do to help in this process as well. Um, accidents are just that, accidents. Things happen and they happen sometimes for a reason and sometimes they do happen randomly. And uh, there are a lot of things we can't uh, fix, but there are some things we can fix. Uh, I was sharing earlier in the evening with folks that um, this summer, uh, Goral Palmer Engineers, and Randy Dutton is on the end there. Uh, Randy's a traffic engineer with Goral Palmer and worked for the state as well at one time. They um, uh, basically were enlisted by the town to begin evaluating all the sidewalks and crosswalks from essentially Greeley Road all the way down to the middle school driveway. And uh, that was in preparation for uh, bringing our crosswalks into conformance with the um, accepted state uh, policies and guidelines. And th that's primarily for uh, folks essentially with disabilities, but also to make them all uniform. There are grades that are required. There are, you've seen these truncated domes, these little domes that have little bubbles on the top. All of those things are not on Main Street and most of those sidewalks were built probably back in the 80s or 90s and uh, there hasn't been much done to them. Uh, we're going to bring those up to, uh, up to standard uh, uh, this coming summer. We are uh, working with uh, the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Elizabeth Roberts is here, and she is a traffic engineer for the Greater Portland Council of Governments. She has been working with us on this plan. Uh, they have also uh, looking at the pedestrian movements. If you've been up on Main Street in the last month or so, there, there are little cameras on a lot of the poles up there, and they're basically counting pedestrians at the specific crosswalks. Um, I will um, uh, introduce our panel first, I guess, uh, to for tonight. At the dais tonight, uh, on my right, uh, Randy Dutton from Goral Palmer. Uh, Patrick Adams has been hosted as our special guest tonight. He is the bike ped expert, I'll call him tonight, from uh, MDOT. Uh, Patrick is involved with all kinds of safety programs, the bike ped across the state. And uh, he's also given us a lot of resources to reach out to uh, as part of this process. Uh, Elizabeth Roberts, who I talked to, uh, I introduced a little bit earlier. Uh, Elizabeth will be working with the project that we have uh, designated to go this summer at GP Cog. Uh, Chief Rumsey is here, uh, is a lifetime law enforcement expert and uh, uh, a real fan of the kids. If you will see him on Facebook, he's always uh, participating with a lot of and interacting with a lot of kids in our community. And, uh, Amy Owen, who we're very fortunate to have uh, as our newest school resource officer. Amy joined us this summer and uh, has been doing a great job in, in the schools. So um, we don't want to monopolize a lot of time tonight with us speaking because we really wanted to hear what you wanted to say. But I'd like to um, just talk, uh, let Patrick talk for a couple minutes about you know, what you are seeing across the state, Patrick. What types of uh, tools can we expect for assistance from DOT, your expertise, and you know the common questions you've seen from communities that have concerns around you know bike and ped safety. Sure and thing. then I'll come back to some slides that we have here. Sounds good. Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming tonight, spending some of your time here. As as Bill said, I'm Patrick Adams with Maine DOT. I am Maine DOT's active transportation planner. Uh, I deal with all issues bicycle and ped across the state. I cover from Kittery to Fort Kent, Callis to Bethel. Sometimes it's all in the same week even. Um, but what I do is I work with communities around uh, bicycle and pedestrian issues, safety concerns, uh, infrastructure, 
programming, safety. How do we uh, make our communities more livable, walkable, bikeable? Uh, we are really trying to work with communities to help create that village concept that everyone is really looking for, that sense of place. Uh, and how uh, we're doing that is we work with communities to talk with them around what the concerns are in the community. One of the things that we do see pretty much uniformly across the state uh, this year, 2021, has not been a great year for us when it comes to pedestrian fatalities. Currently, this year, we're looking at, at, as of today, unless something has happened that I haven't heard about, we are up to 19 pedestrian fatalities this year. Uh, that 19 pedestrian fatalities includes one triple fatality in... Uh, Augusta, and one double fatality down on the coast. So five uh, fatalities and just two crashes. So that really brought our numbers up. So we have 19 this year. Last year, if I remember correctly, we had approximately, I'm thinking we had eight last year. So we've, we've more than doubled our numbers this year. Going back to 2015, up until 2015, we looked at our five-year average of, of pedestrian fatalities, and we were right in the 10 to 12 average range each year for a five-year average. Starting in 2015, we saw a dramatic increase in the number of pedestrian fatalities. A lot of people out there want to point fingers at, at what the cause of this is. There, are, there are, is a definite group of people who believe that the way we design roads, we engineers, <laughs> we main DOT, we communities design roads, uh, helps contribute to speed and make, make conditions more hazardous for pedestrians. When we start looking at the data, you know what that data tells us? There's some, there's some honesty to that, that there is something to say that how we've designed our roads over the years does contribute to the problem. There's another group of people out there who love to point fingers at the drivers and say, this is a driver problem. This is about how fast they're driving. They're distracted. They're impaired. They're making it hazardous for pedestrians out on the road. You know what the data tells us? You're right. There is, there is a driver component to this. Finally, there is a component out there who wants to point fingers at the pedestrians themselves. The pedestrians are out there. They're wearing dark clothes. They're crossing the road inappropriately. They're not crossing at intersections. Pedestrians are impaired. Pedestrians are distracted. You know what the data says? Yeah, that's the case. One of the things that we've done at Maine DOT is we've created what we call Heads Up, pedestrian safety is a two-way street. And under that program, we're really trying to avoid the placing blame piece and pointing fingers at someone else. What we would rather you do is look inwardly. Look at yourself. Look at your behaviors. What can I do to keep myself safe? What can I do to keep others safe? So part of this is when you're a pedestrian, how do you behave on the road? Do you pay attention to traffic? Are you impaired? Are you distracted? When you're a driver, how are you driving? Are you driving courteously? Are you sharing the road with other roadway users? What we see across the state is a lot of pedestrian crashes that really could be avoided if more people were thinking about other roadway users out there. When we start looking at doing improvements, we look at a combination of behavioral changes. How can we change the way people do things? 
as well as what can we do to change the infrastructure itself. We work with communities working through uh, local law enforcement, public works, uh, town managers, schools, and how can we raise awareness about how to be safer as a pedestrian or as a bicyclist? And what can we do to change the infrastructure to make it so it encourages safe behavior? Many communities across the state struggle with the financial challenges right now, especially under COVID, of how can we improve our environment? How can we install um, major financial changes and major infrastructure, sidewalks, lighting systems, whatever it may be, knowing that, that finances may be restricted within a community? One of the programs that we currently offer we work closely with Bicycle Coalition of Maine to offer educational programs, but we also offer infrastructure programs through them. So one of the, the offers I will make to the town is we work with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine on something that we call demonstration projects. And a demonstration project is a low cost temporary installation of a strategy keeping it very general, uh, that could improve conditions for pedestrians and bicyclists and potentially create safer situations for drivers. And the whole idea is these are temporary installations. They're very low cost to install. They're there for one to two seasons, but it gives a community the opportunity to experiment and see if if it works, to see how well it's received. Does it function the way we anticipate it will? All without investing a large sum of money in engineering design and then construction. And several communities around this area have, have taken advantage of that. I know your, North Yarmouth a couple of years ago, probably three years ago now, had done some. Uh, Yarmouth has done some. Freeport has done some. So there are opportunities out there to try some things before we actually implement it. My biggest concern is that we, as this advisory group and we working with the town, jump to solutions before we really know what the problems are. I don't live in Cumberland. I live outside of Bangor. Um, you live, work, play here, you know what the circumstances are. You know what you're observing on the street. And one of the biggest things when I talked to you two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, was trying to hear from you what you see as the problems. Where are the problem locations? Why are these places challenging for bicyclists or pedestrians? Not necessarily jumping immediately to solutions, but finding out what's going on and why it's a challenge, if that makes sense. Hope that's helpful. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm gonna just turn to Randy or Elizabeth if you guys wanted to jump in and add anything, or do you want me to just get to the questions from the audience and see where that leads us to? I, I think Patrick did a great job. I really don't have anything to add at this point. Oh, I think Patrick did a good job, and I don't have anything to add at this point. All right, Elizabeth, in your experience at COG, you've seen a lot of this, so. Um, right, and then I think one of the things I just would, uh, I guess, iterate that, that Patrick said is that, um, you know, before we can solve a problem, we really need to know what it is, right? I don't want to just, you know, throw things out there. Um, it always helps to know what the problem is, and then that's one of the things that, as uh, Bill has said, is that, We've been, you know, taking uh, vehicular traffic counts, uh, pedestrian, you know, counts, um, and, and we even have some speed information just to try to, to get an idea of, of, of what's going on. But again, um, it, it always helps to know from the people who live and drive and walk on these streets. And, and Chief, uh, you or Amy, I know Chief, you did some, uh, some data that wasn't on our big speed trail that everybody sees 
you did some of the data of just collecting some traffic counts. You want to share that before, we, and then I'll get right to questions. Sure. <clears throat> we um, so you've probably seen our um, radar speed trailer around town um, mm. at the police department. We call it BERT. Stands for Big Ugly Radar Trailer. So <laughs> we we put BERT around town, and and he's great because he provides immediate feedback to drivers as they approach that speed sign. They can see how fast they're going. They can see what the actual speed limit is. And that unit does collect data. And we take that data and we put it up on our website. If you've ever been to see it, it's pretty informative. If you haven't, you just go to the town's website and uh, click police department and you find the, the uh, sidebar link for our radar speed display. And every time we take a measurement, it goes up on that, um, on that site. What we know though from the data is that that unit changes driver behavior. So, so as to how accurate it is to get a average speed, it's probably skewing um, more conservative. S speeds are probably higher than it shows because people see it, they know they're being recorded, they slow down. We also have another covert unit that just looks like a small plastic case that straps onto a telephone pole. It collects data that the driver is not aware is being collected. So you're not changing your behavior as you drive by this radar counter. Um, knowing that there was this level of, of public concern and that this meeting was coming up, we deployed that radar counter out to Tuttle Road near Broadmoor uh, the week before Thanksgiving. And we collected a week's worth of data and then worked pretty hard because the system's a little bit funky to use sometimes, but to figure out what the actual average speed was during the time that the flashing lights on Tuttle Road for school zones are activated. And we learned that during that week, the average speed going through the school zone was 22 miles an hour. So about seven miles an hour um, average. So uh, like Patrick was saying, there's a component to this of, of driving. Some, some people are driving too fast through there. What that tells me, understanding what averages mean, is that some people were going real slow, doing the speed limit, some people may have even been going slower than the speed limit because there was a pedestrian in a crosswalk or there was a backup of traffic as cars were turning in and out of the school zone. And then there may have been times when there wasn't traffic backed up and cars were going way too fast through there. So, um, so I think that we'll probably be, my sense is we'll probably be gathering a lot more objective data as we move along to do problem definition. But I thought that might help kind of frame sort of the discussion as we, as we move forward. I hope that's helpful. So I, I would like to just jump in and get to some of your questions tonight. So the panel may not have all the answers tonight. So we, your, your questions, your concerns, your information, anecdotal, factual, all of the above is welcome. And uh, I'd ask you just to come up to the mic and you can direct your questions to anybody here. They'll do the best to answer that information or we'll just put it on our list to kind of come back to you at some time in the future. and. Uh, kind of regroup this group and uh, see if we can uh, get to the, the answers. All What I will tell you is before we go to construction or go to bid, we will reconvene the group to say what we found, what are, the, what are we proposing, and let's, get, let's have some more back and forth dialogue before we actually bid any project that has to do with the sidewalk walk improvements on Main Street or on Tuttle Road. So I'll open it up and it looks like you're ready to go. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Tim Cole. I'm a resident in the Cumberland Center town. And uh, I want you to first off know that I respect you all and value you very much in our community. So thank you all for being here. Um, as far as to what I see uh, in my town, if I could sum it up in one word, it, it's in a hurry. It's, it's hurried. Um, I, I live directly across from the elementary, middle, and high school on Tuttle Road, so we walk over there frequently um, outside of school hours on Saturday, Sundays to Monday through Friday. My wife crosses the street to pick our children up. And what I see is when you mentioned seven miles per hour over on average during school zone, I wonder what it is outside of school zone in a 25 mile per hour zone. and that's when drivers are on their best behavior during school zone. I see when cars do stop in a hurry on their brakes, almost getting tires, the car behind them is in the same fashion. I ride bikes in our community uh, on the roads as well. And when we talk about behaviors, 
from a pedestrian stance, I also see some cyclists that don't stop at stop signs and stoplights. And it disgusts me because that's jeopardizing the safety of me by their actions, because that's upsetting drivers and making them seem uh, unruly to, to drivers. So I, 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 that resonates very much with me and, and has ever since I've been a cyclist. Uh, the education starts there. When we talk about the behaviors of pedestrians at crosswalks, it leads me to the question of what tools are available to pedestrians at crosswalks uh, for them to have at their fingertips to change their behaviors. Are pedestrians uh, being struck at crosswalks and they're not being recorded because they're not fatalities? How many of those exist is a question that I have. The other question I have is how many pedestrians in Cumberland Center are being struck at Tuttle and Blanchard and Main Street versus at crosswalks where there are no buttons, no tools or anything there for them to use. Um, what I would like to propose is, is a, you know, illuminated signs or flashing blinking lights at every crosswalk from uh, the town commons where the gazebo is uh, over to um, the elementary school at Tuttle Road. And I would also like to see flashing lights at the uh, food stop across from the high school. And I just think that that's a hot spot. I think if anyone lives in that area, they can attest to high speeds going through there, no matter what the time of day is, whether it's school zone or not. And, and as a community, I, I think that the, the risk is outside of the school zone. It's when we're all home on Saturdays and Sundays and people are getting to Portland or getting to North Yarmouth or during the winter headed out of town to go skiing and the excitement and the buzz is there. And we're walking around in our communities, going to go sledding or going to food stop to get a coffee and I, I think that's the, the heightened sense of awareness that needs to be there is uh, what, what tools can we have to shift the change in behaviors from a pedestrian stance? And that's all I have. Thank you all. Thank you. Tim, just, just to respond briefly, um, I don't disagree with anything that you said. I think it's, uh, it's interesting that, I think it's, it's cool that our school um, campus is right in the center of town I think that like lends so much to the feel for this community and what makes it so special. Um, I think it's too bad that our school campus is situated between two very busy roads that are pass through roads that the same, you know, we're, you taking your kids to school in the morning, you're getting mixed in with people that are in a rush to get to work in the morning. And, and like you said, going off to, to their vacation destination or to go skiing. And so it, it is tough because of that reason, but I don't disagree with anything you said. I did want to tell you that Shortly after the incident occurred um, that sort of has brought us all together, I went and looked at our crash data on Tuttle Road and on Main Street for, Bill, your memory is better than mine. It was at least three years. It might have been five. And the answer to reported pedestrian crashes is zero mm. on Tuttle Road or Main Street. Now, you know, things happen and we may not ever find out about it. Um, and so I'm not saying that there isn't a situation that we need to work to address. Uh, I'm just telling you what the data, you know, what I found when I went and looked at the data. So I wanted to share that with you because you asked. That's reassuring. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And statistically, we know that that's the case across the state, that it's actually an underreporting of actual events. We do believe, believe, that there are more bicycle crashes than pedestrian crashes that go unreported. But once again, if it's not reported, it needs to be a reportable incident for law enforcement to enter it into the system for us to track it. So it could be somebody who is slightly bumped by a car. If they choose to report that, it may not meet the threshold for, for a formal report. So it could be not an omission issue. It could be it doesn't meet the criteria as well. And, and I, I want to um, amend my statement. We have had at least one that I'm thinking of in the last couple of years, bicycle crashes near the food stop. Um, my research was on pedestrian cr and crosswalk um, actions. But we did have a, a fairly serious crash there where I think a driver was maybe turning into the food stop and a bicyclist was coming through and, and there was a crash. So, so my research was pedestrians. I just want to make sure that I clarify that sure. for you. Sure. Thank you. 
And for anybody who's here tonight, if you, if you care to write this down, uh, Maine DOT has a crash career, uh, I'll try to spit it up, a crash query tool on our website that you can go to. And I can never remember the address. I'm trying to open it up here, and I've made it about halfway. But if you type in main DOT crash query tool, it will call up uh, an app, and you can put in the time frame, whether you want statewide, regional, or individual community information, and the types of crashes that there are. So whether it's a bicycle or a pedestrian, whether it's a rear end or an animal strike, and then what the severity of it is. So you can do all crashes, fatalities, property damage only. And what you can do is there's a mapping feature, and that will call up a map or that shows you the data of where all the crashes are in your community. So you can look at that. And I find that to be a useful tool for a lot of citizens to better understand their neighborhoods and their communities as to where the reported incidents have been. So while, while uh, you guys think of all your questions and want to come up here, um, I just wanted to show you the, so we're all on the same page of the pedestrian crossing activated lights that uh, I was referring to earlier. Uh, these are in the school zone in Yarmouth, just below the high school on, uh, I think it's West Elm. Uh, they're very tall, but they're also uh, very solar, so you don't see any wires going to them. There's no power, which is great. Um, <clears throat> we uh, basically timed them going across, and um, I think, yeah, this little uh, diagram, what I, oh, that's, that's not helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that one wasn't as good. I hope this one doesn't go sideways on me. It will, okay. Uh, let me get rid of, hmm, that's very strange. Uh, well, hang on a second. I don't know, well, this, I've got to edit in a different mode, but um, what, I'll, what I'll tell you is that um, this, this street is much narrower than Main Street. If you look at the shoulder here, you probably got a two to three foot shoulder. Most of our shoulders up on Main Street are almost eight to 10 feet. Uh, so our, our road is at least 15 feet wider on Main Street, and even Tuttle Road is, is uh, 32 feet, and this barely looks 30 feet to me. So um, these, there's plenty of time to cross. There's probably almost 20 seconds once the uh, uh, little actuators are hit. Uh, up in their school zone, they do have a, uh, a, a crossing guard. This is a primary path to the elementary school. It kind of goes through the woods and gets to the school that way. So that's, this is a, a, a staffed area. But for the most part, I thought, um, I thought these lights did a nice job. What I shared with some folks in the, me in the meeting earlier is that when we were looking at them, um, we just didn't know where to get them. And when I reached out to Patrick, he, he connected me with Pete Coughlin at the Maine Local Road Center. And Pete basically said, uh, uh, we'll get you on the list. We'll see if we can get you, you, know, get you some. They were giving them away. Uh, but they have a backlog with their supplier because so many people wanted to do this. What's shocking to me is that a typical set of ped lights for a pedestrian crossing near a traffic signal is, you know, or the school zone lights, for instance, those were almost $20,000 a piece when, when they were installed years ago. Uh, these are now seven as a set. So they have come down significantly in cost. And I think the reflective signage, uh, plus these little uh, beacons up here, and I'll work on this in a minute to, to see if I can get it. But these little beacons do flash. Uh, they are, they're LEDs. They are run off solar, so it isn't an enormous type of flash. But it's enough to get somebody's attention uh, work. I also talked with uh, Sergeant Ridge, and his concern was not just, uh, um, just here on Main Street and Tuttle, but uh, like when you're coming through the Apple, uh, the Apple Barrel area on Blanchard Road, he said, you know, people are just flying. He, got, he said, I could write tickets all day there if I stayed there all day. He said, what we ought to look at, too, is if it's possible that some of these uh, solar installations can do the, you know, 25-mile-an-hour flashing sign. We've seen them on the interstate, but I really haven't seen them in, in these type of applications. But I really thought that was a good idea, uh, getting to your point about, you know, when it's not a school zone, it's still 25 miles an hour, and people are still kind of zipping through there. So... Um, there are a lot of tools. Um, um, 
Adrian, you shared with me something you saw in Europe, and I am still looking for it online. I, I think uh, I found that, Bill. You the, found the it? The smiley face. The smiley yeah. face. Yeah. The smiley face and the frown face. If you're, if you're going over the speed limit, it comes, out, comes up as a frown. It's not it's, – it's a gimmicky thing, yes, but it will catch your attention more than, you know, than a 25-mile-an-hour speed limit sign. And uh, uh, the chief – and I, I showed the chief this because you were in Europe and you basically sent – you captured that picture, and I said – we have to find this because I think those are the types of things that uh, we want to try to kind of encourage people to change behaviors versus do it on, you know, with a speeding ticket in hand because I think it will work a lot better. So uh, I don't I know if they mean. I'm a recipient of one of those smiley faces. <laughs> I, was, I was in Washington <laughs> State driving down the interstate yeah. and came on a construction zone, wasn't really paying attention, and I got the little message on the sign that said, you know, I think I was doing 60 and it was supposed to be 55. And so it's constantly checking your speed. And so I slowed down and that's when I got the smiley face. <laughs> was so, because I had slowed, I had seen I was going fast and I slowed. So I, for, for me, so I they are out there. And some of the units we distribute to communities have that feature built in. Right. So we also have uh, 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 several of our town councilors here tonight uh, to, you know, basically for you to corner <laughs> during this meeting or after uh, to express uh, your concerns to them as well. And Bob Vale, our council chair, is in the back, and Tom Gruber is sitting with that evil Philadelphia Phillies hat on. <laughs> uh, Shirley Story King and Ron Kopp are here in the front row, and Mark Segrist is back here. And Steve Moriarty, our state representative, is here as well. Uh, Steve's going to get us a lot of money to help Patrick send the money <laughs> to us for pedestrian safety. So we got all the players in the room tonight that uh, I think you can address questions to. So please come up and ask your questions. I'd love to hear from folks. And don't hesitate. Yes, hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Rubino. I actually live just across the street there on uh, Lawn Avenue. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining tonight. I actually think this session is extremely uh, timely. And I think one thing that maybe hasn't been uh, mentioned or just maybe the obvious is just the growth uh, in this town, this community. Uh, it comes up in every other conversation. And I think it applies here. I mean, I think the, the school population, uh, the town population as a whole, the amount of drivers, I think that, you know, food stop 20 years ago or how long they've been there uh, hasn't probably quite seen the volume that they've, they've seen lately. Uh, and there's just more kids crossing. And I probably argue on Main Street that may be the busiest, uh, you know, intersection or crosswalk across all of, uh, all the way up Route 9, you know, maybe up into 115. Uh, so what you're just sharing there, those uh, cross lights, uh, that might be a great idea for across the street. Uh, and, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, root cause or issues. I mean, there's a lot of cars turning in and out of there. Uh, a lot of kids cross there. Uh, in the winter, sometimes there's snow banks. And, it, you know, the fact is, matter earlier, you know, uh, distracted drivers. And if, you know, you can put the onus on, you know, the parents to teach the kids to cross. But again, it's not always adults. And sometimes it's kids, right? So you can teach your kids. But, you know, it's hard to, to fault the child, uh, you know, uh, crossing or kids, right? Because that's that's the whole point that they're kids. So, I just wanted to point out the, you know, the the real concern there at uh, at that crossing where, uh, so many times I, I do the little test of I'm in the crosswalk. Are you going to slow down? Are you going to stop? And you know, I I win that, you know, that bet with myself too many times. You know, with the you know I'll usually be with the kids or holding hands. And I'll say, watch this, guys. You know, we'll approach the crosswalk as I'm attending the cross. You know, so um, I'm really concerned about what the kids crossing there. So thank you. One, oh, thing, feedback one, one thing I would just add, you, you say your name is Mark? Yes. Mark, thank you. Um, was talking with Sergeant Ridge, who, who Bill mentioned downstairs earlier this evening about the notion of these lighted crosswalk signs. And um, I'm warm, really warming up to the idea of them. And one of the things I think might be helpful on both Tuttle and Main Street, if we ever consider um, installing some of those, is that there's good sight lines on both of those roads. Mm. So I think what's kind of cool about it maybe is that if you're a driver, you could be back maybe even as far as the intersection um, or, or, or back by the credit union 
and you may see those lights go off because a pedestrian is way up ahead of where you are, but it really puts you in that mind frame of, oh, I'm approaching an area where there's pedestrian traffic and, and it can kind of change your channel a little bit while you go through there. So it has a little bit of a broader application and a benefit, I think, to just that one car that needs to slow down for or stop for that one pedestrian. And so yeah. I, think that, I think that could be helpful. Yeah, definitely. That that makes that makes a lot of uh, sense. There is a lot of li line of sight there, and just uh, awareness. I think probably I have no idea the numbers are. I think a lot of it is local traffic generally, but again, there tends to be. You can almost sense sometimes when it's newer traffic. You, you I'm sure this is happening when you're in a newer town or passing through a town you're not, not used to driving through, and you catch yourself. You're like, whoa, I just blew that crosswalk, or I feel bad. You kind of you saw someone there. You're like, oh, I just missed them. You know that was that was dangerous. So you're going to have that event too. So any type of I indicator, warning, awareness. I know there's some newer signs out out there, but maybe something beyond that. Thank you. So how many of you have been in a rural area, and it's just it's nighttime and it's just really dark, hard to see. Have you ever been in that same area when all of a sudden they put in a street light and it brightens it up and it changes everything? you really notice it. Do you know how many street lights you have on Main Street? Probably not because there's a whole bunch of them. One of the elements about these, they're called rectangular rapid flashing beacons, RRFBs, is like a lot of things, they need to be used appropriately, timely, and strategically. One of the things we really try to avoid is putting them at every crossing because it overwhelms the driver, it's too much, and it loses its effectiveness because there's too many of them. One of the things, I, I spent, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half this afternoon sitting up at the school. If any of you saw a blue car just kind of hanging out at the school, <laughs> that was me. Um, but just watching traffic go by and one of the recommendations I thought of is because there are crosswalks that bracket the schools. What might be an effective strategy and tool is to put one of these as you're entering the school zone, I guess it would be to the east and one to the west. So you're kind of bracketing the school. And what you're doing with that is starting to create a gateway treatment so that people who are coming into the area you see that and all of a sudden it, it's kind of this wake up call that you were talking about and it helps carry through the rest of the zone. Isn't that what the flashing yes. I did I did observe that. It went off at it turned off at four oh one. Hi, uh, my name's Laura Sweet, and um, I live on Cottage Farms Road, so um, this, it's across Main Street from the bank um, and on Cottage Farms and then Sparhawk and Lockwood, the two dead end streets. Um, I think if I'm counting right, we have 10 school age kids that live in our little cluster there. I have a fourth grader and a first grader. Um, and we lived there eight years now. Um, and for all eight years, I think the thing I notice most every time I step up to the crosswalk with my kids and say, okay, let's see who stops. It's almost as if it's optional for drivers. I mean, some just don't notice us and they blow through. Some notice us, look at us, and choose not to stop, even as I wave. And now um, my son, I bought a, um, like a crosswalk or a, a crossing guard stop sign so that when he walks or bikes to school, he holds up a, a crossing guard stop sign. And when he's holding that up, cars do stop. But otherwise, it really seems like a lot of drivers think it's optional. So I guess the question is, am I correct that it is technically state law that they are supposed to stop for pedestrians and stop walk and crosswalks? And it seems clear that drivers don't understand that or choose not to follow that. So um, I would also mention I have personal experience with these flashing lights. I work at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, and my office for any of you who know that area is on Bath Road across from campus. Um, so anytime I need to go onto campus, I have to cross Bath Road, which is a really busy stretch there. And I press that light and cars stop so far back. It's, it's 
every time. It, there's no question. It seems really effective. And that sight line, you know, from way back, the cars are really slowing and everything. So I understand we can't have one of these at every crosswalk, probably, and they lose their effectiveness. Um, but I think something like that really does draw attention and then maybe makes cars realize that it's not an option. They do have to stop when they have a reminder, you know, something like that. But I'm truly concerned for the safety of my kids and all the kids, you know, in our neighborhood that to get to school, because we are close enough, we're only less than a half a mile to school. So we really are within, you know, walking, biking distance, um, you know, to school. And I, it's, it's really, I mostly pick up my kids now, you know, after that accident at Farwell, um, it's really concerning and that's really disappointing because one of the things we love about our location is that the kids can walk to school or bike. Um, so it, it's truly concerning and I know it's concerning. I don't think any of my neighbors from Sparhawk or Lockwood are here tonight, but um, we've talked about it and have an email chain within our neighborhood and um, everybody is really concerned. So I appreciate, you know, you, you taking this up now. So thank you. I, I can just affirm for you, it is the law that people are supposed to <laughs> stop for you. <laughs> Hello again, uh, Eben Sweetser here. I live on Blanchard Road at the Apple Barrel. Um, I went to UMaine and I did a couple years of civil engineering, so I know just enough to be dangerous about pedestrian safety, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert. Um, you know, one thing I, I wanted to rebut a little bit is you talked about waiting until we have a true understanding of the problem. And I think by that you mean you know, how many near misses do we have? How many collisions do we have? How many fatalities do we have? But to me, the problem is not what's the exact number of fatalities, collisions, and near misses, but it's the fact that people are here and they already feel concerned and they don't feel safe. So I think we should change the problem question to what is the problem? Not number of near misses, but how do we feel in the community now? So I don't think we necessarily need to wait to do anything, whether it's rapid rectangular flash beacons, um, more sidewalks, the little signs that go in the middle of the crosswalks, raised crosswalks. You know, if we don't feel comfortable here now, then we can do something about that without waiting for any sort of specific data. Like, I don't want to get to a point where we're like, oh, this is the Eben Sweetser Jr. Memorial Crosswalk, you know, like that's, that's too reactive and not proactive enough. And so everyone knows there is the um, the triangle of um, I forget what it's called. So at the top, at the bottom, you have all passings, um, pedestrians, nothing happens. Then you have uh, near misses, which are not reportable. Then you have collisions, which are reportable, and then fatalities, the very small top of the triangle. So the probability that there's going to be a fatality at every any given place is low, or a collision is low, but it's not zero. And as other people were saying, as the town grows and the traffic grows, that probability increases. So again, just because the probability is low, the probability is always increasing because this, the population of this town has been increasing. You know, we've had our, our best years at the Apple Barrel, and it's probably because all the traffic that goes by there is more and more every year. Um, you know, on that note, and, and thinking back to what Bill said, I don't think a lot of this is malicious in any way. I think it's the way the roadway is designed. So it's wide open, um, it's easy to drive fast, especially, I mean, these old roads, when they laid them out and they were carriage paths, they're just straight. You know, there's no turn between the end of Tuttle Road and the fairgrounds, really. So coming down Tuttle Road, it's, it's really easy to get into a zone where you're not paying attention and you're traveling too fast. So some things that I would like to see are the speed limit sign with the uh, radar below it that gives you feedback because, again, I think it's not malicious. People just kind of forget how fast they're going. And I think, and like you were saying with the, um, the Burt trailer, most people slow down. And I think you put something like that on some of these roads and people will slow down because they go, oh, I didn't notice it. Um, you know, lastly, I would just say, I think in addition to the crosswalks, we should really look at expanding the sidewalk system. You know, on Blanchard Road, there are a lot of close calls. Uh, my fiance, 
who can attest to this, works at CV Mahar, walks um, two houses down. There are five Blanchard Road, we're 15 Blanchard Road. Uh, she drives sometimes because it feels safer, which is kind of a shame. And, um, you know, I've been out there. There's been a few head-on collisions in my lifetime at that corner from people not negotiating the curve. Um, the people always cut the corner, and then you're kind of stuck between the, um, the guardrail and the vehicles, especially when vehicles have trailers. I put a new mailbox up just two days ago. In, that, in the hour it took me to do that, there was literally a car that was going way above the speed limit that rubbed the curb, was six inches from me, and then there was a, um, you know, a big box truck that went way on the other side of the road um, and ran a car off the road. Now, did I report either of those? No. Sometimes I do, but I also don't want to be that guy that's always calling the police, and then the dispatcher calls the, you know, whoever's on duty, and they go, oh, there's that guy. He's calling again, because it does happen. We never do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I worked fire and EMS for 10 years, so I know how it is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think, I think we should just think about the problem question, you know, and then talk more about some of the solutions because again, as a town, we don't, we don't have to wait, you know, and, uh, if we have a committee, you know, I'm certainly willing to volunteer my time. And I think a lot of us are willing to volunteer our time. If we want to do some real simple traffic studies, you know, one that I thought would be interested, interesting would be sitting out in that corner and in an hour counting how many cars cross the center line or the white line, things like that, you know. So if we can support you guys in that, you know, we're, we're more than happy to. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Adrian Kendall. I'm a longtime resident of the town, 20 years, and I live on uh, Lower Main Street. And so first of all, I do want to thank everybody for being here this evening. It's a conversation um, that uh, I think uh, it's, it's unfortunate that it was caused by the, the, uh, the accident that, uh, that did occur, but the conversation has been going on for a long time. And Bill, uh, actually, when we were talking about speed issues, uh, that was well before, before the incident. So hopefully we can, we can do, get something done before, before we have another one. I know that's everybody's, everybody's goal. I also want to uh, particularly uh, sort of mark the uh, comments you had about it. it. Everybody should be involved in the process. Uh, it does need awareness from drivers. It needs awareness from the pedestrians and, and school children as well um, and, um, and cyclists. Um, that said, I think, uh, and I think the common theme here, like is speed and distraction are the, probably the biggest issues. And I think it's not about finger pointing, but we're looking for causes so we can find fixes, right? And the issue with the vehicle drivers, of course, is they're the ones who could inflict the major part, the major damage, right? And we also know that survivability is directly affected by the speed of the vehicle, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take much. I think if you're working with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, I don't think they had a statistic um, that is very, actually, I was, I was kind of surprised by it, but within that, for, I think it's a 10, 10 mile an hour jump, there's a very significant decrease in, uh, in survivability uh, from the accident. So those are all, you know, so, so we are looking at vehicles, but it's not about finger pointing. Um, I like the idea that you said, you mentioned about gateway, um, but I would really like to see that approached from, as the town in general, that when people come into the town, that they understand that this is a big issue for us overall, um, not in, you know, significantly because of safety, of course, but also because we have a major artery that cuts right through the heart of the town, and that uh, that, that relates to uh, our livability and quality of life in general, not just, not just the safety. And so if the bracketing can occur further out, um, that would be great. I think Bill mentioned I'd, I'd come across a couple of signs uh, uh, traveling in Europe where they had the, the smiley face, and it's a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a smiley face if you're within the limit, it's a straight line if you're within five, and then it's a serious grumpy face if you're uh, you know, in excess. Um, you know, just because it was kind of interesting and different, and it's not sort of in your face, it's, it's uh, kind of a nice way of, of just of reminding folks. Um, I have seen, I think in South Freeport, they have one that's a thumbs up uh, on the road over towards, uh, towards their um, uh, the, the town landing there. There's one that's a, that's a, it's a thumbs up, and otherwise it's flashing. And I think the other piece is for the people that live around these signs, they shouldn't be obnoxious either, right? I mean, you don't want to necessarily have flashing because those yellow flashing beacons are, are pretty intense and bright, 
and they shouldn't have that in their living rooms either. So hopefully we can find a happy medium that actually fits what the nature of, of the community is as well. And one issue uh, that hasn't really come up yet um, that may, I think, be important, especially this time of year, is, is glare and visibility in the crosswalk and having maybe lights that shine down onto the crosswalk, again, so they don't blaze everything up, but so that you can actually pick up someone that's in them, especially with the crosswalks where we're talking about maybe not using, and I agree that we should be judicious in the use of the, the, um, the blinking ones, or the ones where we don't, that maybe have lights that's shrouded to pointing down so you can actually see if somebody's in the crosswalk, especially with the, the high intensity beams, people coming towards you, it's tougher tougher to pick folks out, especially when they wear do, they do wear the dark colors, which we see a lot. And on the, with the school resource, I think um, the one thing I have seen, uh, and I've lived in Northern Europe for a long time, and, and it gets even darker and is longer even than here, and we see kids, uh, they all have reflective uh, elements to their clothing, including, and I think the Maine State Police did something similar with the reflective bracelets. They were handing those out uh, one or two years ago. They're still uh, handing them out. They're uh, part and, of my program. Uh, boy, do those make a difference. They are, it's, it's huge how, I mean, immediately you can, you can pick them up. And that may be something to work with on the school side, on the pedestrian side. Um, and then finally, I think the one additional point about the, um, the, the pedestrian activated beacons is yes, they're great for the drivers, but from what I've seen, they also then also create more of um, uh, an appreciation by the pedestrian that they should be stopping and paying attention because there's a, there's a sign for them and, and there's sort of an interactive piece to them as well. So um, those are my comments and thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Tillis. I'm Edmund Sweetser's fiance and I live at 15 Blanchard Road. Um, this is anecdotal, but also um, I wanna raise concern. We do have young children that live across the street from us. Um, and though we talk about the school zone being right here on Tuttle Road, I would, I would want to say that I would think that the school zone would be within walking distance of the school, so up to that half a mile radius. And we have lots of little kids that walk to and from school every day, um, ride their bikes in our neighborhood, and that corner right there on Blanchard Road uh, is highly dangerous if not daily, at least two to three times a week. I'm jumping that guardrail. And I, li and I work 0.1 miles away from my own home. And I have to jump that guardrail weekly to avoid somebody f from hitting me. And to Eben's point, you know, we want to be proactive, not reactive. And looking at other options, not just crosswalk beacons or flashing lights, how else can we protect these children from getting hit? And having a buffer of a sidewalk, I believe, would be in the best interest up until that half mile point for those kids to be able to walk to and from school safely. You know, I am an adult. I am more observant when cars are coming, but if a little kid is riding their bike, sometimes they're not riding the bike, you know, with traffic. They're going against traffic. They're gonna, you know, be hit uh, immediately. And um, every day that I walk home from work, a lot of times I'll ask Eben to look out the window to watch me walk, because we can see from our driveway, my office is, driveway so he can see me leave every day and there has been numerous times of near hit misses and if that's just in that point one mile imagine what it's like for the kids that live further down the way so all I just wanted to say is uh, maybe we want to expand our study to more than just the Tuttle Road and the Main Street and look at you know um, a bigger picture of what's happening in the community as well as um, you know we're looking at climate change and what's good for the environment and people being able to be walkable and accessible would be beneficial as well. And right now that road is not really walkable. I would even bet to say it's not really rideable on a bicycle either at this point with the high speed that comes through there. Thank you. I, I do want to allow everybody to speak, so I'm going to keep the questions open. Don't feel you're going to be shut out if you want to jump up here. Uh, there are a couple of things I do want to share, uh, kind of Evan brought them up. Uh, this isn't going to be a three-year process, I'm not that patient. Um, I, I will share with you when the incident on Main Street came up and the, the, the irony of it all is we started this process over the summer to start to evaluate all these crosswalks. And um, I do have 
this is Goral Palmer's work. Randy's team at Goral Palmer have been working for us all summer, and you probably saw kids out there in the intersections. Um, the, we've already even have cost estimates prepared. Uh, one is for an overlay of the whole sidewalk. The other is uh, uh, for a, um, I'm sorry, this is kind of, uh, <coughs> for, uh, for just a spot uh, area. The whole sidewalk has to be overlaid, but uh, we're, we're looking at about almost uh, over a quarter million dollar investment just in the Main Street and uh, Tuttle Road uh, sections. We went through and uh, evaluated every, every single uh, crossing uh, along Main Street. As obviously, this looks like uh, uh, Tuttle Road right here. But, uh, and identified all the, all the issues from, you know, this is going to be full depth reconstruction to fix this, to the flared entrances, uh, to where truncated domes have to go. And, you know, every, every, <laughs> every inch of that sidewalk was covered. Unfortunately, you know, we haven't constructed it yet. But what I will share with you is that um, there are plans in place. Um, and my experience with this council is not one of, of dragging their feet. Um, Ron, how many times have we had the, the state down on Route 100 at Blackstrap? How many accidents have we had at that intersection? We had Steve Landry, the state's traffic engineer, right in Ron's lot, looking at that intersection and saying, hey, help us here with this. We are in the process now of, of working toward getting, we hope, a project funded that will address a lot of the pedestrian safety in the Route 100 corridor. So while this is kind of a heavy Main Street area uh, project, we also have a heavy Route 100 area, West Cumberland project that uh, we're looking at as well. Um, what I will commit to you is I will put out there at least two more times before we're even ready to go to bid that you know, we can get together in a less formal process because I wanted this to be recorded so folks that uh, couldn't be here tonight could at least watch what was said and could understand what would happen. But what we typically do with neighborhood meetings is we'll have tables up front and we'll roll out the maps and we'll mark them up and say, okay, here's what we should be looking at. Um, Shirley's big question along Main Street is, is yes, the Main Street corridor, but also, also down to the library. You know, trying to get the kids across at the library is really, really a kind of a, a challenge. And every one of our crosswalks, for the most part, there's 31 of them that have to be improved um, in the Main Street Tuttle Road area, are, you know, deficient to today's standards, and they have to be brought up to those standards. But the other pieces, Eben, what you shared is, you know, absolutely on point. Uh, what I don't want to delay is if there are simple solutions for now, actuated signs, you know, flashing uh, speed limit signs, those type of things, those get implemented now while we look at the capital projects and the capital investments for five sidewalk extensions. Sidewalks are expensive. They're, uh, they're over $1,000 a foot. If to build a sidewalk, uh, you know, 1,000 feet of sidewalk is 100, 000, I should say $100 a foot. They're $100,000 uh, for us. And that was just a few years ago, and those costs have just crept up and crept up and crept up. And it wouldn't surprise me if they're closer to $200 today. It's not the cost of the curving and the paved six-foot sidewalks that we build here. It's all the drainage, because once you've basically built a sidewalk, you've trapped that drainage from going somewhere, and now that has to be designed for. That's the most expensive part of these sidewalk projects. So we recognize that. Um, I've worked with Randy for decades. Uh, his team is a great team. They understand a lot of uh, a lot what municipal engineering is about and what it takes to live in a community. And uh, we've built a lot of sidewalks since I've been here. And we would like to continue to do that in a way that is um, of value to the community and not out in the middle of nowhere where no one's using it. But all these issues are competing with a whole bunch of other issues, and I don't want you to think that uh, just because it wasn't addressed today or two days from now or three months from now that it isn't important to us. We do take, take your time, the time you, you know, to come to these meetings to discuss these points, and um, we've had several t discussions about this, Adrian, and I will continue to have those discussions. And I want you to feel comfortable to reach out to myself or the town council uh, or any of these folks. Uh, our police department are very receptive to listening to what uh, people have to say because they'll bring that information to me. I mean, the chief and I talk at least, you know, almost daily. So uh, we have a very good relationship. And you live in a community that's uh, reactive and receptive. And we, we're not going to basically, you know, analyze this to death. The, you know, paralysis by analysis does not exist here. I'm a, 
So I am a civil engineer, and I want to get stuff done. So we really do try to uh, implement some of these projects, and we'll be talking a lot more about them during the budget process and during our capital planning. You'll see me at the planning board in January talking about these types of projects as well. So um, um, some really good points brought up today, and I, I want you to know that we all listen. So uh, now... Do you want to come up and say anything, or has your neighborhood spoken, your piece on your side? You're good? Okay. Okay. Because uh, we talked earlier, and you thought you were going to be the Lone Ranger here tonight. So, <laughs> so Ron, do you want to share some of your concerns with, uh, you know, the western side of town? Because they're out there as well. Hi. My name's Ron Kopp, lifetime resident of Cumberland. I'm currently on the town council. A lot of you know me. I run a wrecker. I have run one for 40 years here. I'm always out beside the road with a yellow flashing light on. That yellow light means nothing to people in vehicles. I mean, I've had my coattails brushed at 70 miles an hour out on the main turnpike. Um, I, I mean, I think these yellow lights will help at a crosswalk, but I want everybody to think if you travel the main turnpike and you go down through by the main mall, what's the speed limit right now? Anybody know? 50. 40 miles an hour in the construction zone. There are yellow lights all over that highway. If Chief Rumsey happened to sit there, he could write tickets until he ran out of paper. If I sit out there with my yellow lights on, nobody slows down, not one person. But if there's a trooper out there that has a car pulled over, the first thing that you do is you lift up on your right foot. It's just the instinct of everybody. When they see a blue light, they slow down. I want everybody to take notice if they're traveling the main turnpike and it's snowing the next time, and you look ahead and you see this flashing light that's green. Does anybody know what it is? Turnpike. It's, it's a plow truck. They've just passed a new law that now I can put these green lights on my tow trucks, and I have ordered some. I've ordered $9,000 worth of them. People are, the nature of a person is they get used to something and they just ignore it. They just don't, they don't react to it. These green lights, to me, are the best thing that they ever came up with. And I believe our town trucks, a couple of them have got them on them, Bill. But it's, it's people are accustomed to the crosswalks. They don't pay attention because they've been there too long. You need to make them different, and that's what will bring people's attention to them. I mean, and I'm hoping that's what happens to my tow truck. I have grandkids that are in the school system now, and God forbid something ever happened to one of them. I mean, it, I don't want to respond to an accident where a child's been run over. I've had two accidents, one at Tuttle Road and Middle Road today, one at Tuttle Road and Route 1 yesterday. I mean, two serious accidents. And I don't want to respond to somebody's child being hit by a car. I do think we need to do something to bring attention to these crosswalks. And that's all it is. It, and it, there are people that are speeding, but you need to bring attention to the fact that there are children present. I mean, and I mean, we'll do what we can. I mean, Bill's on it. And it's not about money, it's about safety, so we'll make it right. Just want to add one thing while we're having the conversation, and a lot of the conversation is circle around children, and, and of course that's, we're all, for, for good reason, and, and because that was a specific instance, but when you were talking about um, the sidewalks and then also uh, the library, um, which are both great points, I, I should point out, I think those are also very relevant to the aging in place considerations that we're facing so that the elderly also get chances to get out and can be mobile in a safe way, and that would include the crosswalk. So while we do that, um, and I'm mindful also of some of the social media for, the, for our community, uh, some of the elderly residents or, or older residents, I should say, are voicing various concerns, and I think it's, it's important to make sure that they feel some of those, that, that they're included in the conversation and, um, and the considerations. Thanks.
The question I have, hi, I'm Tom Gruber. I'm uh, uh, on the uh, council, and I, uh, I have a question for Bill. Is there any AARP funding available for this project? Uh, if we got very creative, uh, if we wrapped it into a sewer, storm drain, water project somehow, that uh, that's really the only way. There are, there's no funding directly under the grants that we were given as a community. Uh, we'll be looking to work with DOT on other potential projects uh, through GP, GPCOG and PACs, as well as at the state level uh, for those types of monies. But uh, each community in the country was giving a set amount of money. It was $100 per person per capita. We received about $866,000. Of that money, we got four categories, and unfortunately, one of them was not sidewalks. I, I wish they were. It would, would be a, a quick and easy fix. But a lot of the, a lot of the timing uh, that was really coincidental to a lot of this and uh, the unfortunate accident um, is kind of stuff that we already had in our pipeline and in our queue to start upgrading and to start looking at. So uh, the, the chief and myself and, and Amy and uh, uh, our sergeant in the back who's here again, uh, we're gonna get him a coffee cup for the council meetings, I guess. Yeah. But uh, he's, uh, uh, he's, he was, uh, they're, they're all, we're all working as a team. So for us, uh, the timing is important, but it's also, it's already been in our plan to look at a lot of this stuff. Uh, we'll continue to look at the sidewalks. The sidewalks that connect to neighborhoods are the ones that we wanna focus on, and those are in our long range plan as well. But the immediate plan that we're hearing tonight is how do we improve that safety, especially around the school zone, but probably in the area that is most busy for our residents. When we talk about the library, before we made that two-mile sidewalk loop uh, down Drown Road and out Wyman Way, that was not really a heavily used area unless you lived in that area. Now it's traveled by baby carriages and people just walking and exercising and kids going to school. Um, we're looking at uh, trying to do a farm-to-table program on our town land uh, on our way to the uh, compost pad in the brush facility down here. If that happens, we're gonna have kids walking all the way down Tuttle, Street, Tuttle Road down the sidewalks and crossing many streets that we wanna keep safe. So there's a lot of things that have happened in our community as, as we've gotten bigger, but we also wanna be safer. And I, I don't think we're talking you know, millions of dollars here. I, I think we're talking reasonable amounts of dollars, especially for the safety signage and uh, some of the sidewalks improvements that we already had in our capital plan to move forward with. So I think you'll see coincidentally otherwise or just good planning on our part that there will be a lot happening in a very short period of time. So um, if anyone else has questions, come on up, but uh, we will be staying for a little while afterwards if you wanna ask questions off, off camera too. I think I got a somewhat of a captive audience here tonight, and maybe now I don't have the right people in the room, but I know you people who do know the right people. And so one of the things that, that has bothered me recently, and it, it's, it's about safety, and, and it's, it's uh, prim primarily is, is school buses. And technology has, has, has advanced rapidly. And uh, if you're all familiar with a school bus, it's a kind of a wigwag, and it's easily recognizable. And a lot of the new school buses, it looks like a carnival. Uh, and I really recognize the fact of going to building a house in, in Harrison and going up through uh, Gray and Raymond, and the school bus is up there. And it, it, it's very disconcerting to see this uh, carnival of lights. And it's, what is this? And so, you know, a school bus doesn't need all these lights. It just needs that one light. Bing, 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 something that we, we all recognize. That's a school bus. And so my, uh, I think Veroni points it out right, quite well, is that, you know, maybe the green eyes. It, let's, let's standardize what we're going to do. You know, if we're going to put lights on Main Street, let's not confuse them with, with lights in another community or something else. That, but I, I'd like to see some standardization because people become familiar with standardization. And, and uh, you look at the cars today, and, and, and most new cars, you, you turn on your blinker, your headlight goes off, uh, which is, you know, that, that's, a, that's a clever innovation. But 
all this innovation doesn't necessarily translate to safety on the road. Uh, so uh, I, I would urge the people that, that are recognized that, who are making the rules uh, that let's standardize what we do. So we have a crosswalk. Everybody recognize that this is a crosswalk, the same standardization of lighting, uh, and, and I, th I think it'd be more effective for uh, our safety. Casey Putnam, I live on Main Street in the center. And I apologize if somebody asked me this question between the time that I was watching on TV and I got here. But a very simple question, where does a crosswalk start? There have been a number of times around the food stop or whatever when I've been on the sidewalk and I've said, gee whiz, do I need to step into the street in order to um, have a car stop for me? Or is there a way, quite simply, that we can stripe a little wider so that uh, it extends into the, into the sidewalk and that can be part of the sidewalk? Um, maybe that's a silly question, but it's, it's one that I've, a lot of times you see people hesitating and as a driver you say, are, are you you're gonna go? There ought to be a way that we know when we actually are entering a uh, sidewalk. And the other thing, as we talk about sidewalks, uh, my apologies to Bill because he's done a lot to improve the things, but along Main Street, there's a good part of the sidewalk that is ineffective or not usable during storms, whether it be ice storms or or just heavy rains, and I, I am sure that you were talking about part of the cost is the, is the drainage, but the Moss Side Cemetery uh, entry is much better, but still problematic, and so those are just two things. Thank you. you want first? Sure, so, so the, the law, though it's been a little while since I read it, basically says that motorists must stop for pedestrians in the crosswalk. So you know, your point's very well taken. Do you have to step off the curb and, and potentially into the path of danger before someone is compelled by law to stop for you? And, and, and sadly, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, as to whether crosswalks could be extended so that they go up onto the sidewalk, that's for probably a traffic engineer to answer. I, I'm not really sure about that. But it is, it is like, um, it's really difficult, and I've struggled with that in the past when I used to do traffic enforcement much more than I do now. Um, if you get stopped by me, you have done something really amazing, by the way. So kudos to you if I have to stop you. Um, but but that is that is really like um, we're talking about the responsibility of pedestrians too. It's different with children, I get it, but we have a responsibility to have our head up, to look and make sure that we're making eye contact with drivers, that we're not stopping stepping out into the road until they've recognized that we're there. You're saying, yeah, but if I stand on the sidewalk and they're not required by a lot of stuff for me, they're going to keep going by and I could be there all day. And I, Casey, I, I totally hear you. I, you know, if I had the answer to that, I'd probably be on Jeff Bezos' yacht with him right now. Yeah. So yeah. the good news, the good news is two years ago, I think it was in the 2020 legislature, uh, legislation that was put forward by the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, uh, championed by, by several uh, legislators uh, has created a change to that and under current state law under the new change a an individual who is at a marked crosswalk technically only needs to demonstrate intent to cross so you don't have to step out you don't have to wave your hands I'm just saying that's, no, what the, that's how it's worded a Officially, a pedestrian just needs to demonstrate intent to cross to activate the need of a driver to yield to the pedestrian. That's in a marked crosswalk. It's important to remember if there's not a marked crosswalk that as a pedestrian, your role is to yield to the cars. So... Thank you, and I had one other uh, related question. It was 
there was talk about the buttons that you push at the intersections like Main Street and, and uh, Tuttle Road. Um, and you're talking about gateways extending back the, the zone of influence of your, of your education. Um, what is the possibility of moving the button? I know it's very convenient because you've got a pole there that the light goes to, but if you could move that button back uh, a few hundred feet so that I'm intending to cross at the crosswalk, I can activate that and not have to stand there being impatient and wondering if I can, if I can dash across the street uh, between cars. Is, is any, I'm sure thought has been given to that, but what is, the, what is the thinking and possibilities? So if I understand the question correctly, unfortunately we're pretty well regulated under the Americans with Disabilities Act as to how far away from no. the actual crossing point that right. actuator has to be 10 feet. Yes. I can't remember. 10 feet <laughs> is the maximum. Part of that is because of, of people with mobility challenges. Yeah. Too bad there couldn't be some way of doing something, getting a head start. Yeah. <laughs> now the question could also be, do you have enough time to cross? If you do not have enough time to cross, maybe because you're a slow walker, maybe because you've got an injury or whatever, if it's taking you longer to cross than the signal allows, that's a conversation we right. can have with engineers and with the city to extend the amount of time you have to cross. But as, as we all know, drivers get very impatient if they have to wait. <laughs> it's when, when drivers are waiting for nobody that they get frustrated. So it's, we're, it's a really a balancing act of trying to keep as many people happy as possible. And in the process, we really make nobody happy. So just um, building off a couple of things, you know, that we can do in the short term, um, you know, the in-road pedestrian crossing signs, you know, those are pretty cheap. Those are a few hundred dollars. We could get a bunch of those for the town. You know, nice things about those is, again, they're cheap. Um, they're movable, so we can pick them up when it snows. We can move them around to different crosswalks so people don't get in a point, uh, you know, they don't get used to it. So one day it's on Main Street, one day some of them are on Tuttle Road, whatever. Um, the other thing I was thinking, you know, we look at the survivability rate of crashes. So, of course, I did a very unofficial Google search. And, uh, you know, 40% fatality if you're hit by a car at 30 miles an hour, 10% uh, fatality rate if you're hit at a car at 20 miles an hour. Um, so maybe we could do something very simply on Main Street, reducing the speed limit in the 30 mile an hour to 25. I don't think that's terribly unreasonable. It's 25 on both Tuttle and Blanchard Road. Um, you know, just these would be simple, quick, cheap solutions that could help improve safety that don't take six months of design, planning, permitting, and all that. So just a thought. Thanks. So Randy, can I put you on the spot just to answer the question that Bob had related to uh, where I think he was heading toward just uniformity and signage, uniformity and uh, signals, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the MUTCD and, and how that works and how that's applicable to everything that we kind of kicked around here tonight. Yeah, and, and I think the comment hit the nail on the head, really. Um, there's a manual called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, MUTCD for short, um, and it's all about standardization. Um, and it's basically so you can go from Maine to New Hampshire to California and everything looks uh, similar. Green means go, red means stop, a stop sign, you know, has eight sides. Everything is, is similar. Now, within that, there is room for variation, um, but standardization is um, a key to traffic because it goes to driver expectations. Um, when they see uh, a red light, they know to stop. Um, that has to be consistent through all the states. 
Um, but as far as crosswalks, you can have a crosswalk. It'll look similar, but you can do different types of stripes um, and that sort of thing, and, or different types of signs to enhance the crosswalk. But, you know, the, uh, the key was that, you know, there does need to be standardization. And as I think was said earlier, too, putting, for instance, the flashing lights, um, you want to make sure that you're putting them at key locations and not everywhere because what happens is um, they become background noise for a driver. If they see the same thing every single one, pretty soon you start to um, disregard it. You know, if you see sign it, I mean, you, anyone driving to work tomorrow morning, uh, if you think you'll see one or two signs and you pay attention to them, and then the signs just kind of go away. Um, because they start to, to blend in and you start to, to think about other things. So they do need to be at key locations um, and enforce where you really, wanna, where you really want <coughs> drivers to, to pay attention. But you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to de-emphasize the other locations because when you, when you put it at one and you don't put them at all, you have to make sure that you're not de-emphasizing the other locations. You have the proper mm -hmm. signage um, and the advanced notification. So it's a balancing act. Uh, thank you, Randy. Um, <clears throat> our, school resource, our school resource officer, uh, Officer Amy Owen, is here. And Amy, how, how, how do you feel we could engage the kids in this education? Because it's not just, a, it's just n not just the grown-ups. It's also the kids. It's bicycle safety. It's pedestrian safety. You, you got any ideas or any thoughts about how we implement that? Because I'm sure during your day, uh, I don't think they give you a, an hour a day to talk to the kids about bicycle or pedestrian safety. So how do you see that uh, fitting in with your role as the SRO? That's a great question. Um, and no, I don't, I don't get an hour <laughs> a day, every day to do that. But we did get some time um, to talk with the middle schoolers about bike safety. Can you talk into the Chiefs mic? I think your mic is not working well because I don't think people at home will be able to hear you. So. Okay. Yeah. It's not even oh, plugged in. well, that helps when it's plugged in <laughs> <laughs> or has a cord. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so we don't have a, a ton of time to talk to every student about um, bike and pedestrian safety, but um, we have made that a priority to um, go into sections of classrooms and and talk about that with kids. Has gone over very well. Um, it's a great way to also build relationships and. Um, and talk about a lot of the topics that everyone has brought up today, including um, that uh, self-reflection of what am I doing to make sure that um, I'm being, I'm visible and I'm looking around and um, I can be aware of the fact that the unfortunate reality is that some drivers aren't paying attention. Um, so that's, that's been a topic that specifically within the middle school, um, they've been very receptive to. And um, so, yeah, I think doing more of that as the, as the season for biking is starting to wind down for a lot of kids, um, it doesn't mean that the topic is any less relevant, especially in terms of, of walking to school and everything. So um, yeah, I've worked with some of the teachers and I think we can absolutely continue that work. So one of the commitments I can make to the town tonight is uh, somebody had mentioned the reflective slap bands that state police had given out. That's part of a program I'm running uh, with law enforcement and, and municipalities. So what I can do is, is deliver to you several hundred of the slap bands. They're 15 inches long, highly reflective, can be distributed through the SRO through law enforcement. I know I've worked for four years with state police and the troopers are just carrying them in the vehicles with them and distribute them as needed. I also have highly reflective strips that are 
uh, highly reflective material. They're adhesive. You cut them to length. I can also make a couple thousand of those available to you to distribute through you, to distribute through the town office, however you'd like to do it. I well, appreciate that, Patrick. Um, Elizabeth, I feel a little bad. Uh, your report isn't ready yet. The data that you and uh, uh, Harold have been working on for us is not available. But when we get together, I think again in February, I think we'll have that data, I hope, back. So you, you could share that. And what do you think that will, uh, you don't have that, obviously, the data rail. What are you looking for as a traffic engineer when you get that pedestrian data back? Are you going to be able to help, help us with some of these crossings? and best management practices and those type of things. Right, and, and one of the things that, <clears throat> sorry, that I've heard tonight is it's, it's not only um, the crossings, it's not just you know where kids are crossing, it's also this need to slow down traffic, to kind of send clues to drivers. Um, this is a downtown area. This is where people are walking, this is where people are biking. And one of the things that I did also wanted to point out was um, GPCOG is also putting together guidance on complete streets. Um, it's a term I wanted to throw out there. Complete streets means it's a street designed for everybody, for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for vehicles, and transit where there is transit. So um, with these, with this guide, we'll come up with some suggestions. Um, there are different ways, some of them are lower cost, some of them are higher cost, to um, make this, you know, a place, a place for, you know, everybody, complete streets. Um, yeah, and, and, we'll, and we'll have we'll have, um, we'll have data in the report. Um, it'll help us determine, you know, what could be an appropriate um, uh, treatment. Um, you know, the MUTCD that Randy referred to has guidelines on, you know, when a signal might be appropriate or when something else might be appropriate. So that the data will kind of tell us what level of, of treatment could be more appropriate. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we'll stick around for a few minutes uh, if you have additional questions for us, but I do want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, Sergeant Lachance is in the back of the room. Uh, you can bug him, too. He's, uh, <laughs> he's, he showed up, and I'm kind of glad. Our Chief Rumsey uh, and Officer Owen is here as well, and please feel free to talk to them about your ideas or about other problems that maybe we didn't identify tonight. Uh, Whitney Miller, our communications director, is in the back of the room. She'll be the one announcing these meetings. Uh, you guys have been basically empowered as our committee, so we, uh, we hope you'll be back and hope you can at least uh, share ideas, and uh, we'll come back to you probably, I'd say, sometime in early February with uh, some ideas that we're looking at for the Main Street and Tuttle Road corridors and then trying to evaluate other areas around town where we see maybe some of the signage that we talked about and uh, we'll ask uh, Officer Owen to come back and see how many uh, tags she's distributed uh, over the last <laughs> few months. So thank you again for being here and really appreciate your time tonight. Thanks again.